What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. This is the last time I'm doing the intro because we have a baby here that we're bouncing, trying to keep asleep desperately so we can do this podcast. Jenna and I are going to talk a little bit about how things are going with us parenting wise. We'll do a little birth story. And so, you know, if uh, you're looking for your kind of regular uh, where optimal meets practical fitness content, this won't necessarily be it, but we will talk a little bit about Jenna's training and stuff like that. And so without further ado, Jenna, how are you doing? I'm hoping and praying that we get through this podcast without any interruptions, but if we don't, that's totally fine. Um, we have a, a new baby here with us, so makes things a little bit more challenging. Um, I guess we wanted to start off with a birth story. Yeah, let's do birth story. Let's, um, you, you go, you go. I'm going to do, you're going to do most of the talking. I'm going to do most of the question asking. You do your thing. Okay. So it was probably, we went in for an OB appointment the Wednesday before she was born. And I actually had them do a cervical check because I was just curious. I, in the back of my mind, was so convinced that she was not going to come on time and that I was actually going to have to be induced, which wasn't necessarily what I had in mind for my first birth. But, you know, this is super unpredictable and it's entirely out of your control how your baby is brought into the world, essentially. So I was kind of open to anything and everything, but I also just wanted to to see how things were progressing. And at that appointment, I was zero centimeters. And I was super disappointed because this was about a week and a half before her due date. And I was doing all of the things to try and jumpstart labor, but it just felt like nothing was working. Um, And then came Friday, I went to work for my full shift and came home. We made dinner like we do every single night. We took the dogs out for a really long walk. We came in, we took our showers, we get on the couch. Can we pause real quick, actually? Can we, can I, can I, can I just interject really quickly? So the next, that was that Friday, right? That was a Friday. Yeah. That next day I was racing and supposed to race in a 5k, um, that I was excited about that. Just, you guys can follow me along with this, my cardio bunny era. Uh, and I was pretty pumped about it, but I really like wanted to get a really, really good night's sleep. Like I was like, oh, I'm going to get a really good night's sleep. The race was at like 5 p.m. the next night. And so I took a little bit of melatonin, which I don't normally do. And I was like, let me take a melatonin. Actually, I took more than I normally take. Normally, I take like 300 micrograms or 500 micrograms. And I think I took a gram. That is a lot, people. That's a lot. Um, I also might have taken like a smidge of a pot gummy. Um, And I was we were like all done with the night sitting down on the couch and I was about to zonk. Like, I was like, uh, melatonin was hitting. I was like, all right, we're, like, we're going to watch a little TV. We're going to pass out. And you looked at me and you were like, I think I'm having contractions. And so, yeah, you could keep, keep going. I didn't mean to cut you off there, babe. Yeah, it was funny because I had no signs of labor whatsoever. Like, we, like I said, like my day was like every other day. And, you know, we got on the couch after we took our showers, still felt fine. We turned on a show that we were watching and within like, three minutes I had fallen asleep which is pretty standard for me um and then probably around 9 30 I woke up I went to the bathroom we resumed watching our show and then 9 45 I, I just got like cramps and I've had cramps before and I was like okay like they're just regular cramps you know they go away then they went away and three minutes later they came back and they went away and three minutes later they came back and I looked at Jordan and I was like I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure I'm having contractions. And we both kind of just laughed at each other. But in the back of my mind, I had a feeling like this is different than it's been in the past. So I continued to monitor them. And, you know, they were roughly two and a half to three minutes. Yeah. And and at the time, I think we both were like on Google. We're like, we're like, oh, you know, how, how... what is the the early onset of contraction supposed to be like? And we're just like looking at how many minutes in between, how painful, what's it feel like? And yours felt and were timed apart as if like you had been having them for like a day or more. Like the stories that we were kind of reading online was like, people have contractions and people, they, people go into labor and they're like, went and got my nails done, right. went to the grocery store, took a shower. Like they, they go about their, their day. Yeah. And they're like, once you've been having contractions for a while and it, they start to become a certain minute, distance apart that's when you should go to the hospital and you were already having them that that uh like a couple minutes apart yeah when we Um, went to that ob appointment that third that wednesday the ob said to me you know if you start having contractions every five minutes then you should come in and you should you should go to the hospital that's what you were having i was having them every three minutes yeah and so we were like we were like oh that it's probably not that because we would they would have crept on a little bit more slowly but it was like 
out of nowhere from no contractions to like you should go to the hospital we were like nah that's probably not it and we were like we we're in denial for like a good hour yeah it, it, i mean it literally came out of nowhere i was not prepared i had no signs or symptoms whatsoever my day was like every other day and there was just no nothing that indicated that labor was going to start so it kind of caught us completely off guard and you actually had fallen asleep on the couch while i was sitting there timing the contractions and i came upstairs probably around like 10 10 30 and i took a i took a bath and i was like maybe the bath will help just kind of like ease ease things a little bit um And then after my bath, I got actually into bed because I was like, all right, let me just go to sleep and then I'll wake up tomorrow and this, you know, this will be a a joke like, haha, false labor. But by 12 o'clock, I knew that this was not false labor Um, or shortly thereafter, I actually woke you up and was like, it's pretty bad. Um, And you're like, all right, like if we can push it a little bit longer, let's push it. So I made it to about 130 that morning. And then I came in and I woke you up again and I said, we have to go to the hospital. So we got to the hospital probably a little after two and they did a cervical check and I was two centimeters dilated and 80 percent effaced. And they said, we're going to monitor you for two hours. Just keep an eye on, you know, the baby. And yes, you are having contractions. But she said, I'm going to come back in two hours, check on you again. If you've progressed, we'll will admit you. If not, we're going to have to send you home. So two hours later, you know, when you're, if you've been through labor or, you know, you've, you've had that experience, you know, that those contractions, they hurt. So I'm sitting there, you know, for an hour sweating, uncomfortable. They didn't give me anything to help kind of with that discomfort. And two hours later, she comes back in, checks me and I'm still two centimeters. So they sent us home. And so we got home probably around 530, maybe 536. And we, had the you might want to talk about this. The we had the dogs. Yeah, we were we had plans to like, drop the dogs off at a friend's who's a trainer nearby, and this wasn't like we were supposed to drop them off like the next day. It was like a planned thing, and so it actually worked out pretty well. We got home. I got home at six. I, I think I took the dogs for the walk and put them right in the car and drove them. And so yeah, we were home from what like six to ten thirty. Six to ten thirty. By the time I like, walked the dogs, we had something to eat. I think you took a nap. And I took the dogs to wherever they were going and I came home and I was, and you were like, yeah, let's just pack the car and let's go. And At that point I was, I was dying. Yeah. I was having contractions every single minute. Um, so it was to a point where I knew we needed to go back to the hospital. And when we got back to the hospital, they checked me and I was four centimeters and a hundred percent of face. So at that point they admitted me, which is a huge relief when you're in labor and you know, you go to the hospital thinking that you're going to have a baby and they send you home. So I was super excited that, you know, we were being admitted and I just felt like I had gone through labor for so long at this point that the nurse asked me, do you want an epidural? And for a while that was not my birth plan, which I use that term super, super loosely just because, you know, people do have birth plans and their birth plan doesn't go according to plan and they're super disappointed. And then their birth experience is just not a positive one or not one that they are happy with. And I didn't want that. So I didn't really stick to my plan the way I thought I was going to. And I'm totally glad that I didn't. As soon as I got that epidural, probably around one in the afternoon, um, I mean, pain immediately gone. I could actually enjoy being in labor and I spent majority of the day sleeping you were able to get some work done but I spent majority of the day just sleeping and trying to save all of my energy because I knew when it was you know time to push I wanted that to be super efficient and you might you might have you might have to jump in real quick so like um I'm, whatever somebody's gonna have to say this and i'd rather be the one to say it is that like epidural epidurals are dope um that's a stupid way of saying it but but uh, I, whatever. I don't want to make this a, a big high horse. It's not even a high horse or more of a soapbox moment, but like, you, you know, I'm talking to you right now, Jenna, I'm looking at you when I say this, like, and I, I would say this to any woman in my life, like do whatever you want to do when it comes to birthing and your birth air quote birth plan, like natural birth, not natural birth, like at home, doula, this, whatever, like whatever feels right to you, do it. There is like a little bit of the like a little bit of that like sh- shame. And it's funny. It's like there's a little bit of this parenting shame of like not doing something you think you're supposed to be doing um, and by people who did that thing. And that happens. That began with this decision to get an epidural. Um, and I think there's just like shame. Like if you 
can, right now, basically my entire explore feed at the time was like all pregnancy stuff and then birthing stuff. Like the more we talk about it, the more my phone listens, the more I consumed a lot of that content. And there was just this like crazy glorification of natural birth. And I think that's awesome, by the way. It's amazing. That was kind of your plan. But like it, the plans change. The epidural was awesome. You're going to continue to talk about your experience. And I just think that there's like the, that was the beginning of all of the potential shame parents go through of like what they should be doing you know the book says you do this and so and so does this and i just i've been told from a lot of people in the last like year as i've been trying to talk and learn a little bit more about just parenting is that like that is that never goes away that there's always that feeling of like of you know of what other people are doing and i guess that that extends to not just as i'm talking about it, it's like yeah it's probably with everything when it comes to like comparing to other people but I don't know if you're out there, you're listening, you're feeling like, oh, I, I, uh, you know, I wimped out and I didn't do a natural birth or something like that. Or I thought I'm, you know, I'm supposed to have a natural birth. And then I, at the last minute, it was so painful. I got an epidural, like, yo, it, do it. Like there's, I hated that shame that I was just like watching content that was like making it feel like that was some sort of a cop out or that's not how you're supposed to do it. Like, fuck that kindly. So all right, continue. I completely agree. Um, yeah, I think you put it really well. I think there is like a badge of honor that, oh, I had an unmedicated at home birth or I had an unmedicated birth in the hospital or whatever. And that if you have a C-section or if you do get an epidural or if your birth plan doesn't go according to plan, that you, we, and that's you, all awesome, you got the, the easy way out. Yeah, and that's all awesome, by the way. Like, but the, like there is no inherent right or wrong is all I'm trying to say. Like there is no there is no right way to to have done this and i just that, that like if you want to be proud of your natural birth experience and being like oh i did that as a as an amazing thing my body was able to do and i did it naturally and you want to be proud of that that's fine but i would beware how that pride comes off a little bit i would i just if it were me i would pay attention to to kind of my, that the effect it might have on other people when i talk about something like that there's a little survivorship bias there and and it could be us projecting but that is certainly how I felt consuming a lot of content in and around the time that we were we were going through this. So cool. Let's move it on. Yeah. Um, okay. You, you whatever. However you choose to birth is a beautiful and yeah. a special, amazing thing, and it's fucking hard no matter how you do it. Um. So okay, we're gonna move on. Anyway, so around, I think it was later in the afternoon, probably around five or six. They came in, they checked me, and I still was four centimeters dilated. And here I am thinking we're like at eight centimeters, ready to kind of get things going. But no, I hadn't progressed. So we started Pitocin and Pitocin did exactly what it needed to do. Um, it was funny by 10 PM, I think the nurse came in and checked me and I was nine or eight or nine centimeters. And she was like, all right, you probably have like another two hours, three hours before time to push. And I think like 30 to 40 minutes later, I called her in and I was like, um, I'm feeling a ton of pressure and it was time to push. So they brought in a mirror for me, which highly, highly recommend. It was the most epic thing to watch. Um, so yeah, I got to watch basically her head being born. And it's funny because I was closing my eyes because I was trying to push so hard because I was so close to having her head out. And I... I guess I just had this image that her head would come out and then I would have to push a little bit more and then her shoulders would come out and then the rest of her body would follow. And <laughs> I had my eyes closed, pushing, trying to get, you know, her head to pop. And all of a sudden I open my eyes and she is on, she's on my chest. So 12.01 on April 7th, baby, yeah. baby girl was born. Right. 12.01. And on that note, I mean, again, I don't want to do what I just did, which was like to put my, our experience up on like a, on a pedestal somewhere. But if you have... If you have the opportunity to, to kind of watch that happen, I'll speak to like directly to the spouse here. Like, obviously, I'm not the one being, you know, doing the birthing. Like, it was awesome and most beautiful thing to watch. Like, it was awesome. And and I think you and I joked because you're in the, the you know, the, the first responder world and you see a lot of crazy stuff. And we always joke around about like whether or not other people would be able to deal with like just like things that happen to the human body. Right. You know, just things like that. And this you joked around, the, you know, the, the common husband passes out or some something like that you know you're like are you gonna be okay are you gonna be able to watch and like i i told you i was like i think i am yeah i think it's gonna be great and it was it was great and i recommend if you're i don't know if you are somebody that's like i don't know if i want to watch it absolutely watch it's the most beautiful thing and what you were saying is like the her head was coming out and you thought it was gonna be like head comes out shoulders come out waist comes out or whatever but like the head came out her head came out and then one second later she was on your chest, right? I mean, like, it just was like, oh, her head's out, bloop, like, the rest of her came right out, which was fucking awesome. Yeah, she came, she came 
very very quickly right at 1201 actually yeah and, and it was like 1155 and it was just funny because in that moment it's like this is her birthday like is it gonna be today is it gonna be tomorrow and it was like 1155 and like we see all that head of hair we're like oh my god she's coming like 1157 1158 and the the doctor even said she was like i think she's gonna come today and like right when she was born she looked at the watch and she was like 1201 it's like son of a bitch wanted to wait till sunday she wanted that sunday that 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 birthday it's just funny that's that's just yeah yeah, I mean, overall, it was a beautiful birthing experience, and I actually enjoyed giving birth, so I have zero regrets about how I chose to birth and choosing to get an epidural, and it was the most incredible experience, and I look forward to maybe doing it again someday. Um, that's how much I enjoyed it. So, yeah, that's pretty much our birth story. Anything? Um, did you do anything and the answer can be no, and that can be by itself really good advice for people or good to hear. Did you did you do anything prepping that you feel you look back on? And you're like, oh, I'm really glad I did that to prepare. Maybe like something you brought to the hospital or something you were like going in with a mentality. Like I'm trying to think if there was anything like, oh, that was super clutch. Either like something you mentally prepped or something you like physically prepped. Was there anything? I think during the early, and I, it's, I feel weird even saying early stages of labor because I feel like I never even got to experience early stage of labor because I went from zero to 100. But you know, just going through some pretty intense conversations with Aaliyah, um, my pelvic floor therapist, she and I basically, she said, you know, you have to get to a point where you can surrender your body to those contractions. And I think in the very, very early stages, I was able to do that, which I think was super helpful. Um, when I did start having those contractions every three minutes, just kind of accepting that like, hey, your body's doing exactly what it was created to do right now. Just try and breathe through every contraction and try and relax and just allow your body to surrender to those contractions. And I think that's what made, you know, from 9.45 p.m. to 10, 1 o'clock the next day when I finally got the epidural, what made it a little bit more manageable um, because contractions are and labor's labor's intense. It really is. Yeah. Okay. Any anything else before we like leave the the hospital, metaphorically speaking, and move on to like just like some other stuff about what our life's been like so far? I was super impressed with the hospital food. I mean, that's not. I know that's like random, but like we both crack up that like the food was awesome. Like they I had mean, the best brownies, and they had amazing brownies. They had they had like literally the, that sort of brownie that's like medium rare, like dense, like like thick. You know what I mean? And we we were ordering it at like breakfast. <laughs> We'd be like, oh, could we have a four hard boiled eggs and uh your toast and we'll, we'll each have a brownie and they were like oh was it the last part um we joke that we'd go back one day just like go to the cafeteria go go to the cafeteria and eat um anything else from the hospital um we overall we had amazing nurses um some better than others but, some but, better but, than but others but overall, overall yeah definitely amazing amazing nurses which i appreciate um my ob was great she did exactly what she needed to do also if you're interested um just from, I guess, my field of work and just being interested in the female body and what it's doing to create this life. I asked to see my placenta, which was super cool um, when she was born. So you can ask your OB, hey, can I see it? Um, that was pretty that was pretty special to me, just that your the female body creates a whole organ to support this life that is growing inside of you. It's pretty, pretty miraculous. So I would definitely recommend asking to see it if that's something that you're interested in seeing. Yeah, I think the that first night with her was like the first cliche like uh, meme of like, you know, like when the when the guy's taking the baby, he puts it in the car seat, he's leaving the hospital and the doctor's like, all right, see you later. And he's like, no, he's like, I'll follow you. He's like, you're going home too with me, right? Like almost like how how am I supposed to know what to do with this thing? And that that night was the first moment of that where like I just remember her being in the like bassinet cart thing next to the bed and like us just like being like, we sleep now and like what's going to happen? Is she going to get up? Is she going to cry? Like just that first moment of like, well, nobody prepped us for like, what's going to happen this first night. But yeah. Um, yeah. My parents always said babies don't come with instruction manuals. And it's so true. You know, you come home with this little stranger that, you know, what do I do with you now? Yeah. Let's do, let's do a couple light ones. Um, well, I don't know if there's any light ones. We'll do a couple light ones. We'll circle back around. I want to do a little bit about breastfeeding, talk about family boundaries, um, and then some like working out stuff. Um, all right. How good are baby smells? How many times a day do you smell her? Is it a hundred? Is it a thousand? I love this question because 
this certainly a, the limit does not exist moment like just she smells unbelievable like i just like the second you the second you change her diaper or, or you take her clothes off to change her diaper you like Stick your face in her her belly and just like inhale all yep. of her scent. Yep, yep. Because the minute you like unswaddle her or unzip the onesie, like you just get like smacked in the face with like her, her just like her smell, her aura, and it's it's intoxic, it's intoxicating. It's awesome. It's the best thing. It makes me smile every time. I don't ever want her to lose it. I'm sure she will at some point, but like she still smells like her, you know. And that's just like so been so beautiful. It's been so awesome. Yeah. Okay, next one. How are the dogs with her? The dogs are great. Um, I knew that they would be great. I didn't doubt them for one second. What, what would what would the dogs not being great look like? Like you know what I mean? Like them like pawing at her and them like like showing signs of aggression or or, or um, possession. Like yeah, they don't resource they don't, guard in you know, some way, do shape, or form. That. Yeah, no. Gunner Gunner absolutely loves her. He always wants to see her, wants to smell her, wants to kiss her. Callie's a little bit more when it's on her terms. When she wants to smell her, she comes over. She'll smell her. She d- she's kissed her a couple of times, but she's very much kind of when she feels like it, she will interact with her. Gunner, Gunner, and and Emerson are going to be best buds. And yeah, I just definitely. I just know it. That's that's Gunner and Callie's personality. That like that, like none of that is as odd to me. Gunner is like <laughs> like he's just like the happiest. He literally is like the ha be happy dog that like that's literally him he's that like happy dog gif or whatever um and callie's a little bit more like she's happy being on her own sometimes right and just like isn't necessarily like a like a like that let's say like gunner is which is fine totally cool and that that all makes sense to me given their personalities for sure yeah um on that though if we're just talking about dogs real quick like the whole like bring the blanket to the hospital and bring it back to the dogs to familiarize the scent like that's not necessarily something that matters a whole lot i think having a relationship with your dogs where like if they are doing something you don't want them to do that you know how to communicate to them to stop is by far the most important um yeah if they are doing something you don't want them to do you should have a relationship with them such that you can communicate to them please don't do that and that they listen that's like by if you want to prep your dogs for the baby prep your relationship with the dog in that way and everything else will go swimmingly um okay um let's do best purchases that you highly recommend in in an underrated fashion um and and maybe something that's overrated and so under let's go we'll do one underrated each that that we think yeah you know like we didn't think how important this might be or how great this might be or whatever the wipe warmer wipe warmer we love the wipe warmer emerson loves the wipe warmer like night and day when you change her without it and with it um, highly recommend. We have one pretty much in every room of the house that we do diaper changes. And then I think the hatch, the portable hatch sound machine, we stick it in her stroller. And every time we go out for walks and we have that on, she seems to be very at peace and at ease. Yeah. So I, 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 I crack myself up just because I never had baby. I didn't really have any relationship with babies in my life. Like I didn't have any baby cousins or, you know, Emerson's actually the first baby I've ever held. Um, and so, I always like had this image of people shushing babies and it was one of the first things you were doing in the hospital. And I actually like it triggered me because for some reason I had never thought as to why somebody is shushing a baby. I thought that they were like, or like shushing a child. You know what I mean? Like, 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 shh, like when somebody's crying or something like that. And I thought that they were like doing a shh as a, like a verb to like be quiet, to shush someone. But it, it, it is not that you are actually like providing white noise, which is really soothing for the baby. And I didn't realize how powerful that would be. Like the first night in the hospital, I'm not saying it was, it, she was like screaming and wailing and then you put the white noise on and she stops altogether. But I, it really did matter and it matters with her. It is a very helpful tool. And so that sound machine thing is just like this little USB, tiny little thing that plays white noise. Um, it doesn't connect to Bluetooth, which is nice. Just whatever. If you're like into like getting, not putting EMFs near your kids as much, whatever. Let's not go down that route. But yeah, those are good ones. White warmer, hatch sound machine. I, I think... I think what she she's in right now is that like baby Bjorn bouncer. There are so many things. We have so many like little chairs for her and like little things to put her in. There's like that mechanical it's one. It's the Mamaru. What is it? Yeah, it's the four moms Mamaru swing. And um, she likes it. She, she likes does, it. but she doesn't spend much time in there but, because. But it's, not even, but it's not even that. It's it's it's. I would expect her to like that thing better. That thing is crazy. It has like all these different mechanisms. It can go up and down in different directions and rhythms. And it does it on its own. You don't have to do anything. It's plugged in. Um, 
And then, then there's this like this baby Bjorn thing that I'm currently bouncing her on right now with my foot. But it's like you have to do it. There's no mechanism. It's like a very simple model. Like this thing has probably been around for a hundred years. I feel like you know, like somebody made this and there, and it's just been iterated. Is there's no there's no electronics, nothing. And and she freaking loves this. Thing. I think it mimics how she felt in the womb. Every time I would walk around, you know, there's a little bit of a bounce. I also think that when we are soothing her, if she's crying, I do more of a bounce than a rock. And I think that being in the baby Bjorn bouncer mimics that same motion and it's comforting to her. Anything else underrated? Um, underrated. Well, I was I was going to say the carrier, but I just, we only have, I only have we only have one experience with one carrier. It just happens to be a nice one that somebody got us as a gift, which is nice. Um overrated, anything overrated that you're like, "Ooh, I just feel like we've only used X amount of products. Totally, 100%. Right now, for sure. sure. So so I don't have... Yep. I don't know. I can't really say that something is overrated yet. (laughs) I'm trying to think. First six... Hold on. First six weeks, very important piece of context, the changing table is overrated. Okay, fair. (laughs) Because because 90% of the changes that we're doing are like on the chaise, in the couch, or like on the bed in our room because that's where she's sleeping right now. So I know eventually she'll sleep in the nursery, in the crib, and and the changing table will get a lot of use. But like funny, like we have this beautiful changing table and my my freaking lower back is snapped in half because I'm doing... I'm changing 88 diapers a day from like knee height on the chaise or something. Um, But yeah, I know that will come good. Yeah, I can't think of anything yeah. at right. the moment. We can move it on. Um, all right. Um, what has your routine been? I'm about to have my daughter, and I'm wondering what that first month looks like. Expect to not have a routine. You're basically on baby schedule. I mean, she wakes up in the morning, and it's... Okay, but, but we have a, m- m- we have mini, a- mini routine in the morning and at night, maybe. You know? Yeah, a mini, very, very loose mini routine. Um, I think... I think first, if you're, you know, being a new mom, just be prepared for anything and everything and don't have specific expectations because this is a brand new little baby and a brand new little life that's a changing and, you know, getting adapted to this world. Just don't don't feel like you need to stick to a hour by hour schedule because the chances of you sticking to that are slim to none. I mean, when she gets up in the morning, it varies between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. But... But that is totally true. Like on a macro planning planning level, on like a day to day, don't have any plans. But I do think that there is a value to having these little micro routines where like if I tell you, hey, she's going to wake up at three o'clock tomorrow, you know exactly what we're going to do. You're going to grab her from the bassinet. You're going to feed her. You're going to punch me. I'm going to get up, take her from you, change her, re-swaddle her, give her back to you, top her off, put her back in the bassinet. And that routine in the middle of the night where I know exactly how that's going to go is is really important to me personally. I, I want I want us to have uh, little systems in place. Yeah, little systems in place. And like in the morning, we have our little whatever. The um, after her last sleep, you call me. I come do the change. You I and then I will hold her. Maybe I'll take her outside. I'll try and give you like a half hour in the morning to like brush my teeth, brush wash teeth. my face, totally so get the, changed. The, yeah, right. But then from like okay, from that to like nighttime, there's you know it's a crapshoot for sure. But having those little micro systems, I think, can be helpful. I don't, I don't want to have to figure that out every time. Like, I don't want you to be like, Hey, like, can you change her? No, I want you to know that's my job and it's time to change her. Like I'm doing that, you know? And I think us having that communication of like, I don't want you to roll over and be like, can you do it? Or something like that. And I don't want to do that. So there's a lot of decision fatigue. I want us to be like, Oh, this is what we do. I feed her. You change her swaddle, give her back to me, feed her bassinet, try and go back to sleep. Right. And I think that comes with good communication between the two of us. And then also, like we said, just having those little systems in place and like understanding that when she does wake up, this is the order of operations of how things are going to get done. And then we, we have a pretty, we've always been this way though, even before she was born. Like we have a pretty consistent nighttime routine and we definitely have that with her. Like she's asleep every night between 9.30 and 10 p.m. every single night. Um, and that's because we prioritize that routine and just sticking to a routine, I think long term is beneficial for not only us, but for her. Do we want, somebody asked about help. Do we want to talk night, night nurse now? Sure. So Jenna and I hired a night nurse and I think it's so funny. He's like, as I talk about this, I feel the, I feel the need to over explain because I feel like our parents in the room with us being like, what's a night nurse? You know, like we didn't have that or we didn't either. You guys don't need that or whatever. But essentially it's a nurse that comes twice in the beginning. They came twice a week 
two nights per week. Now they're coming one night per week. It's a total luxury. We don't have any family here, so we were thinking, hey, having some help, at least in the beginning, would be great. Essentially, somebody who comes between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. to kind of, because you're breastfeeding, they, you still need to get up and breastfeed, but like to do some of the soothing, some of the going back to bed, I would say that's been helpful mostly for me. I think because you have to breastfeed, you're still getting up. Those are nights I can, I'm sleeping in the bed too, so I'm I'm like awake, but those are nights that my duties are kind of taken care of. And in the first couple of months, twice a week, that was really nice. Um, and having it, they were kind of like a little bit of a coach, right? I mean, it was, it was nice to, we learned quite a bit about some of the systems. That's kind of why it jogged my memory is like some of those systems were discussed by the night nurses in the beginning. Like, hey, this is what you guys should be doing get her into a routine. You guys get into a system in the middle of the night. And so I was really uh, helpful. I think it's a mega luxury, super mega privileged to be able to afford that. If you can afford it. Highly, highly recommend. I find that to be more worthwhile than maybe like help during the day and stuff. Although I'm sure it's, it's both, but like I feel a distinct difference in my ability to be a dad and a husband and my work with five hours of broken sleep versus like three hours of sleep. Like if I can just get a little bit more sleep, I'm doing all right. And I think that that never have I felt more of this, put your oxygen mask on first thing, like days where we have okay sleep, which again, the bar is pretty low, but okay sleep. Like I think our fuses are longer, like our communications better. My, my quality of like optimism is higher. So yeah, night nurse is dope. Definitely a a privilege, definitely a luxury, but it, you know, if even in the beginning for a couple of weeks, couple of nights a week can be really, really nice. Yeah, we've loved having the night nurse, and like you said, we've learned a lot of new things or tips and tricks to help us to help her, which has been very helpful as new first time parents. So it's definitely a luxury, and if you can afford one, I would. Yeah, like you said, you know, it's almost better to ha- I don't know to have help in the middle of the night. So that you can get sleep, so that you're not pouring from an empty glass, um, than having somebody during the day. But that's just from our own personal experience. Yep. Let's talk about establishing boundaries with family. I think we're going to stay on this for a bit of time. Then we'll talk about breastfeeding for a bit of time. Hi, Gunner. Um, and then, <laughs> and then, uh, and then we'll we have a couple more after that. So setting boundaries with family. We we tried to set them. In, I mean before we even had her, I made it very clear that I wanted to have a couple of days just you and I with our new baby before we had family come to visit because it is such a new chapter of our lives and I didn't want to have family breathing down our necks right out of the gate. I wanted to enjoy a couple of days alone, just the the three of us as a new family, just so that we could also get into a little bit of a groove with things. And, you know, hey, Jordan, you're going to do diaper changes while I breastfeed, you know, just just setting those, you know, I don't want to say roles, but helping helping one another and just getting into a little bit of a routine before, like I said, we had family on top of us. Um, so we made that very clear to our families in advance that, you know, the first week nobody is coming to visit. And then after that, we will, you know, basically we'll give you the green light when we're ready to have you come visit. Yeah. Yeah. And for context, we live in North Carolina. Our family live in New Jersey. And I just will say that if you live nearby your family, this is very different because people come over for an hour, say hi to the baby, hold the baby, maybe help you with, uh, they cook a meal for you. They bring food over. They do, they help you laundry and then they leave and they let you rest and they, they don't put any burden on. And I'm not saying, I don't want to say that our family's burdened us. That's not what we're saying, but like, um, they, that's how that would go. Anybody who's like lived near family, that's what happens. They, they come over for a bit and they leave and they know, Hey, you just have a new, new baby. Maybe you want to nap. Um, you know, you Jordan has work to do, whatever, like, but that's different because they were traveling eight hours or driving or flying down here. And so we had a rule of, of not having people stay with us. That was like one of the things we we're like, you know what, like in order for us to like, that was something that was important to us. Just have our own space for a little bit, especially during this time. And so listen, there's a place to stay right next to where we live. And so family stayed there just to kind of mimic that routine a little bit. It didn't work out exactly like that, but, um, I, I kind of want to start with like the most important thing for me is like, don't feel bad if you want some space from your family, like if that's what feels right. And I think it's not that we needed some space, like don't, we don't want to see you guys ever, but like we definitely felt that where it was like, we need a little bit, we need to create a little bit of space for ourselves, especially because 
our family was coming down in such broken chunks. It was like your, your mom and dad for three days, then my mom for three days, then my dad and his girlfriend for three days, then my brother for three days, and your brother for three days. And it turned into like 30 days of having family over kind of all the time. And so all, all I want to say is if you're out there and you're feeling a little guilty because, you know, you're like, you know what, I, I don't really want my family all up in my space. I, I kind of want to figure this out on my own and get just get my feet wet with it. I, I don't want people to feel bad that they aren't begging their family to come over. And on the flip side, if you think that that's super helpful and you want that, that's awesome. I think there was this was another moment of like, are we bad people? Because we, you know, are we, we were, again, that like shame, that parenting shame that comes up of like, oh, are we, should we be doing this a different way? Should we just have everybody come crash in our house? And, and you know, okay, it didn't feel right to us that it didn't feel right to us for us to do that. And so that's a decision we made. And I think, I think it was a good one, um, given how the, all of that ended up going anyway, which was swimmingly, smoothly. Um, and so setting boundaries with the family, I think that was a big one of, I mean, I, I think that at least my family assumed they would all be staying with us. And that was a conversation we had to have. And I was like, I, I love you guys. Like, this is just what feels right for us right now. And it is how we will have the best experience together when you come down here to meet your granddaughter. And that just is what felt right. And there's probably people listening right now that you guys are scums that you didn't let your family come stay with you. And whatever, that's your, you can feel that way. It didn't feel right for us. It's a big, I think it's a big ask to assume that family can just come and crash at your house when you're first time new parents and you're coming home with a newborn and you know I did have a vaginal birth and I was you know wearing pads all day long and I was still figuring out how to breastfeed and just entertaining family that just did not seem like something I was going to be able to manage like I was just trying to stay afloat for the first week and just having family on top of us or even staying over you know that was just yeah something that I mean we it was a hard no like Jordan said we love our family and you know we want you to come and meet your granddaughter and your niece but we're drawing a line and we just can't be flexible with that boundary I think having just open and honest communication we were like hey guys don't come till this time hey guys we need you out of here at this time like I know these sound like kind of like I I almost as I'm saying it feel like we you know it feels like not warm um but it, it's what was ultimately going to make it a warm experience. And it was. It's just, it's like, if that sounds not warm, then think about how it would go if your family live across the street, around the corner, in the same town, in the same state. It probably is more like come over for a few hours and then leave for many hours and then come over for a few hours. And so why would you do that if that wasn't the best way to do this? And it, that is the best way to do this, I think. And that's something we were like, yeah, we, we wish we could have something like that. And so we just wanted to set some boundaries. And I think that open and honest communication, even if, you know, listen, I, th I think both of us had a kind of moment of growing up where we're like, hey, like this is our house and our family. And we're starting our, as our own heads of this, our, our new family. Like we're going to have to speak up about what we want and the way we want and things to be done and yeah you're gonna have to draw a line and you're gonna have to set some boundaries and you're gonna have to set some rules and at the end of the day you have to do what's best for you and your little family and if that means you know telling family you can't come or just being more specific about your needs and wants then so be it yeah all right good anything else on the boundary stuff no, I don't think so. I also just think give yourself a, a period of time with like if you have, you know, like my parents came to visit and then like two days later, yeah, like yeah, your yeah. mom came to visit. The vacation give, came the day that your parents left. Give do yourself that. a little bit more time between visits because it is a lot. I almost laugh at like, I would have, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to have people come visit me at the hospital. They're like, I don't want all that at the hospital. Listen, come to the hospital Come to the hospital when we have like 10 nurses there to help and then give us a little space. <laughs> and there's like uh, visiting hours yeah, when you know you yeah, have yeah, to get yeah, out yeah. at a certain time. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Let's do. Um, all right. Let's talk about breastfeeding. We'll talk about breastfeeding, working out. And then some people said, how are you guys making it look so easy? Is it? Uh, and so I want to do those three. Let's talk breastfeeding. How is it going? And and ultimately, like, you know, how did you know that you were able to do it? And, and what are some of the things that you've learned? Let's talk a little bit about that. I had no clue how breastfeeding was going to go. To be honest, I was a little bit nervous that my body wasn't going to produce milk and that I wasn't, she wasn't going to be able to latch and it just wasn't going to be a successful or positive experience. Um, I just, I never want to get my hopes up. So I always, you know, same thing with like my birth plan. Like I always just wanted to keep in the back of my mind, like this may not go the way that you want it to go and that's okay. 
a fed baby is a happy baby. So however that goes, that's fine. Um, in the hospital, we did have a ton of help from our nurses and lactation, which hi- like you speak to a lactation consultant. They are super knowledgeable and very helpful, and they want you to have a positive experience with breastfeeding as well. So it went as great as I could have imagined. Um, she cluster fed that second night, and I didn't think I was going to make it through the night because she was feeding every 30 to 45 minutes. Um, it was a lot. I did not sleep, but in her doing so, my body was producing milk and my milk came in probably a couple of days later and she latched great from the very beginning. We did have a little bit of an issue on the left side with her latch. Um, and I did have to pump for a little while on that side. And then once I reintroduced, the left side to her. I mean, she's just a rock star. So I I really did luck out. And I know that that's not everybody's experience. So speak to lactation and find ways to improve your experience if possible. But yeah, I mean, I have an oversupply now, uh, which our entire top, we have two freezers on our fridge. The entire top freezer is just bags of breast milk. I have so much breast milk, um, which is a blessing. I'm very proud of my body and everything that it has done, you know, not only just to create her and to bring her into the world, but now to feed her and nourish her. It has been wonderful. And we are actually trying to start to introduce a bottle at least once a day. And I'm a little bit emotional about it. I don't, I don't know. There's like this biological connection that she and I have. And there's something very, very special about watching her latch and feed and her little sucking sounds and her little eyes looking up at me while she's feeding. And it is my favorite thing in the entire world. And there's a part of me that's a little bit sad that we're going to start to try and introduce a bottle, but I cannot be available 24 seven. Um, eventually there's going to come a time where I'm not going to be able to have her with me or something's going to come up and she needs to be able to take a bottle. Um, and I also want that for you, Jordan. I want you to be able to, you know, you'll never be able to experience breastfeeding obviously, but you can experience feeding her and there's something really special about that. And I want you to have that experience and that connection with her as well. So we're trying, it's not going great at the moment, but I know that in time it will get better. Um, so yeah, this is another, and, and I, and I'm not, I'm not calling you out Jen at all, but like, this is another point of shame, right? It's like, if you go into the comment section of I, I forgot who I was following the other day, but it was basically like somebody feeding her kid and she was feeding formula and the whole comment section was just ripping her apart for not breastfeeding or whatever. With, with, by the way, without knowing anything about their situation. And that, yeah, the shame there is crazy. If you don't breastfeed, you're a bad mom. Like it's not, you, you know, uh, you failed. It's crazy. And even you talking about it right now where you're like, I'm sad that I have to give her a bottle because this is beautiful thing. Like I don't want to create a gap where people feel shame when that doesn't work out. I know that you don't want to do that either. I, we're super in touch with that um but i mean we i was fully prepared for it not working we have yeah you were pessimistic you were you were pessimistic and just as like a default like kind of like oh i'm i i have for i you know you were having like a feeling i was like i feel like it's not gonna work you know and you were starting to like mentally prep and we were just like hey if that's what it is that's what it is like it's it's totally fine totally fine totally and that's why we bought formula and we were fully fully prepared for that to be our experience and i was totally okay with that as long as i knew that she was being fed because that's what she needs. Whether it's from me or from formula, she's fed, she's happy, she's healthy. That's all that matters. In the same breath, I do think it's beautiful. It's been a beautiful thing. It's been beautiful just to watch. I think you've done an amazing job. Um, breastfeeding is literally a 24-hour day job. It is insane. They do not prep you mentally for this. They did not prep either of you nor me watching you do it. Um, for how much on call you'd have to be, how much it, this is entirely on you and how kind of a little bit feelings of helplessness in me would start to creep up. I just like talked about that in therapy a little bit where I'm like, I'm like trying to overcompensate with doing other tasks because this is such a crazy, crazy task. Um, and so that's been my big take home is that, and, and I, it's such a big task that I want to say it's such a big task that people who decide not to breastfeed just because it's a huge task and fuck that you want a little bit more of your life uh, and that's going to ultimately lead to you being a better mom and enjoying your life more. That is a totally defensible reason and, and, and I would never tell somebody that that's a selfish decision or anything like it is a crazy, 
crazy 24 hour a day job. And if somebody was like, nah, fuck that, dude, that's like, that's, that's wild. Uh, you know, when I can just feed, I can have formula, not have it affect my body in some way, um, have other people feed. I, I think you do you is what I'm trying to say. Like you make that decision for yourself. If you're out there and this is, you're going to go through this experience. Um, but it's been nice. It's been nice. It's definitely a bonding thing for sure. Let's let's, that's not like, um, that's not even like, um, something that is up for debate. That's certainly a bonding thing. Um, but yeah, we are trying to bottle and you know, so that shit, man, so you can go take a shower, right? I mean, you can do that anyway, but I'm just saying like, so you could take an entire feeding off that, that you might be able to go, you know, whatever, go do a workout and I, and you don't, I can close, you can close the door. That's how I think about it. Like you can't ever really switch off your brain because I have all the tools she needs minus that. And so at some point, if she needs that, you need to be on call. You have all the tools she needs. So if I am working up here and I'm doing work, or I'm recording a podcast. Like I don't think in the back of my head that I'm needed, that I'm, or I might be needed. Like I might be wanted, you, you know, she has a blowout. You're like, Hey, come change the diaper. Let's swaddle, whatever. But like, I, I have a peace of mind. You don't get, you don't get the peace of mind of I'm not, I'm, I'm going to go out for two hours and there's nothing that I am biologically needed for, but I have that. So I, 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 if we could even do a bottle like once in a while to give you that peace of mind, like go, you go do something or, you know, whatever if we we're going to see Sebastian Maniscalco and like your parents are going to come, like they need to feed her with a bottle. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I've been I've been talking to some friends who are doing bottle feeding, and and, they, and ironically, they have also expressed like a beautiful experience of sharing that as a job. So I think that there's just a beautiful thing across the board, just taking care of your kid, regardless of how you're doing it. Yeah, I, like I said before, with your whole birthing, however you choose to birth, like at the end of the day, you do what's best for you. You do what's best for your baby, um, and you just it, it's hard not to feel guilty or feel like you're doing something wrong if you choose you know, not to breastfeed anymore. If breastfeeding doesn't work out and you have to, you know, uh, use formula. There's, there's nothing wrong in that. And you're not a failure and you're doing right by you and you're doing right by your baby at the end of the day. And that's all that matters. Agreed. Let's talk about working out. And this is a timely question. We're doing this timely because tomorrow you're going to the OB and they're going to, you know, it's that like cliche six week, uh, you can start training, you can start exercising again after six weeks, which is like, there's a crazy non-contextual blanket recommendation that just like doesn't take into account what you did prior or how your birth experience was or what you're going to go back and do in terms of exercise. It's just like, and I get, I get how these guidelines come about. We need general guidelines. General guidelines are important, but like when it comes to the individual, you have your own body that had your own birth experience that is, has plans to go back to your own style of training. And so really the, the whole like, oh, six weeks, you're good. Like is just non-contextual let's say lacks context um but if you you know if everything looks all right at your appointment right if everything like you have that discussion with the ob and everything sounds good um we our plan is to do a workout together tomorrow um how are you feeling about the last year of exercise and a lot yeah i've had we've had i've had so many questions about this just like how you're doing with your body's changed. You haven't trained in the last year very much. And yeah, where is your headspace right now? Where has it been? And and what are you gonna what are we doing about it? What are you planning on doing moving forward? That's a very loaded question. Um, I think last year, April through when I found out we were pregnant, I was in the best physical shape that I've ever been. I was the strongest I've ever been. I had the most muscle I've ever had, and I felt the best I've ever felt. Um, and then we got pregnant and I was in immense pain. I had every symptom under the sun. I'm sure a lot of you remember. I just, I mean, I've posted a lot of my story. We've done a podcast. I was as sick as one could be. Um, so because of all of the symptoms that I had, I spent majority of my first trimester on the couch, throwing up, not feeling well, and I didn't train. And when I did train, they were half-ass workouts and I didn't want to be there. I just didn't feel great. And I wasn't lifting to my standards. And I think that mentality plus how I was feeling physically just snowballed. And I never saw the gym. I mean, I think midway through my second trimester is when I stopped lifting altogether. I had little to no motivation whatsoever to even lift a weight. I would try every once in a while to maybe do one or two workouts. But I mean, those one to two workouts quickly became zero. 
and the best that I did was go for a walk and that was all that I felt up for and that was kind of what it was and I struggled with you know you're not doing enough your your muscles shriveling up into a raisin you're losing everything that you've worked so hard for you know you got to get back into the gym but also like I don't feel like it and I don't feel good and the gym I have no motivation to be in the gym and I you know struggled with those two feelings and those two emotions and I tried to justify that like going for a walk was enough um and then giving birth and postpartum the last six weeks, I have not touched a weight. I have not touched the gym in months, months. And my body has completely changed. I loved being, I don't, I didn't love my experience being pregnant, but I loved having a pregnant belly. I loved feeling her kicks. I loved holding my belly. I loved my bump. Um, and that's something that I still miss, but my body has completely, completely changed. And I look in the mirror now and it's not one that I recognize and it's not one that I'm super familiar with, but it's a new body that has given me everything that I've ever wanted and more, my daughter. And now it's feeding her and nourishing her. So I I struggle with the two feelings of like, I'm not the person I was pre-baby and a fucking course you're not like you, you, of course you're not, but also feeling like, you know, I... My body just did the most incredible thing it could ever do. And I'm so incredibly proud and grateful for it and everything that it's done and everything it's continuing to do for her. So I, it's it's very much back and forth of, of hating my body one day because I hate the way that it looks, but then loving it for everything that it's done for Emerson and for me and continues to do for her. So I definitely struggle. And I definitely have days that are better than others, but I would say majority of the days in the back of my mind, I don't really love to look at myself in the mirror. Like I'm super quick when I get out of the shower, I wrap myself in a towel. I quickly put clothes on because I don't like looking at myself because it's to me a little bit of a disappointment because I just expected that throughout my entire pregnancy and even postpartum, I would feel better and I would be able to do more and I would be able to continue training the way that I, I guess, always envisioned that I would be able to train during my pregnancy. And it just didn't go according to plan. Yeah. Point point of potential shame number 407,000 of like, you know, you just felt you had a tough pregnancy. You just felt like crap and you were working up until, you know, whatever. Not, not that that by itself, you know, p- people work, you know, people work, but you were working. You didn't feel good. Like you were working long hours. Um, you know, you were coming, coming home so late that like, uh, 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 no, like you were coming home in a circumstance of like an immense back pain all day and then immense back pain on like an hour commute home in the car to come home to like scarf down dinner. Like when were you going to train? And it just, it kind of snowballed where it was like, yeah, that just, you were feeling like crap and, and also to kind of make that time and the level of discomfort, it just like didn't happen. And yeah, I, p- people have asked me because of what I do, right? How does that change you know, our discussion around this stuff. And the thing is, it kind of, it kind of does. And it doesn't, it, it does insofar as you and I are very self-aware of this stuff. Like we're very self-aware of that, of that negative self-talk. You're very self-aware of like, shit, man. Like I, I you, like you, I've watched you do this where like you've had dark moments where you get really into the negative side and those feelings are going to happen. And I've watched you shorten the time between that feeling and and the more positive feeling. And and that shortening of time reflects you working on, I'm putting words in your mouth because I know we've talked about this, working on the self-talk where that negative emotion comes up, you become aware of it, and there's a line of, of reasoning and discussion with yourself where you don't spend a week there, you know, a month there. You might spend a few hours, a night, a day, a couple of days, right? But the time between the, that negative emotion and reminding yourself how amazing it is that your body is done, and that, that you haven't lost all this fitness forever, and that there's a, a ton of future ahead of you, and all those positive things. It's been so impressive to 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 watch you do that, and like, yeah, because I think that there's an idealistic idealism that you won't ever feel that way. That you won't. That you're like, oh, I'm. Um, I'm just going to feel super proud about what my body's done and it's done this beautiful, amazing thing. And like, I should be super grateful. And I just think that's so idealistic to that, to think that that's just like always how you're going to feel. I think what is more realistic is you becoming self-aware of those negative emotions, feeling them, letting yourself feel them and ultimately 
not sitting in them for as long. So yeah, it's been awesome. And, I, and I'm sure super pumped to help you, right? I think that working on the Headspace stuff is cool, but like you're also allowed to be excited to get back to training, to get back to your not just aesthetically how you looked, but also how you felt, you know, you, you, you were training really hard and that feels really good. You, I'm sure you felt strong and fit and that's mostly what I look forward to for you. But yeah, I'm damn excited to get started with you doing anything. Yeah. I, I, going back to what you said, just about, you know, my self-talk, I had a chat with my therapist earlier this week because I was, I wish I, I was, and I am still struggling with my appearance. And, you know, we did talk about how much of that negative self-talk, you know, it's, it's taking up space in my brain and I don't want it to take up space because I have more important things right now. And I think that's why, that's another reason why those feelings are so, they're not as long, you know, the the negative self-talk, they they don't linger as long because I am a full-time mom and she needs me and my brain doesn't have time to sit there and feel sorry for myself because I, I don't have anything to feel sorry for. You know, I do and I don't. I look at her and I'm like, snap out of it. You know, you don't want your daughter having these thoughts about herself. So you need to start painting that picture and, and setting a good example for her. So I'm the, the person that I was before I had her, you know, she still exists and she can still, you know, come back and be strong and, and have muscle again. And yeah, tomorrow I have my six week postpartum appointment. And that's something I, I should say, I chose to wait six weeks. I could have started working out, you know, two weeks ago. I chose to wait those two extra weeks because I wanted to make sure that I was healing appropriately and that when I did start training, I didn't do it too soon and then had to pause because I did something I shouldn't have done and then have to kind of wait a little bit longer and then pick up again. I wanted to make sure that I was healed and feeling my best before I introduced training again. And I think that I'm very much at that point now. So I'm looking forward to meeting with my appointment tomorrow or meeting with my OB tomorrow to basically just confirm that everything looks great and that I can get back into the gym. And we did create my program on Friday and we split it up. You can probably talk about, you know, or I will post about this on Instagram because a lot of you have asked um, just exercise selection, why we chose to do things the way that we are doing them. And I will share some videos of me kind of getting back into the swing of things. I'm excited, but I'm also, there's a part of me that's not excited just because I'm not as strong as I once was. I don't have as much muscle as I once did. And I'm going to be a little bit discouraged when I go to pick up a weight that I was once able to lift with ease and now it's super heavy or now I have to go down in weight. I'm also not looking forward to how sore I'm going to be because, you know, if I had just continued training, you know, these are thoughts that I have. If I had just continued training, I wouldn't be this sore. And so that's a little bit discouraging, but I think having you there with me to do the program with me and to support me and kind of cheer for me and have Emerson in the gym with us, which is something I've always pictured in my mind um, that, you know, this will be a lot more of a, a smoother transition and a lot more enjoyable experience back in the gym. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll talk about it a bit more. You talk about it on your stories and stuff, but b- basically I think very, very simply oversimplification. You can look at exercises on a scale. I'm going to, instead of looking at it as a scale, we'll look at it in black and white exercises that involve a lot of core stability and core demands and exercises that don't. And so for you exercises that you know, your core and your pelvic floor are the things that have really taken like a, a, a beating, you could say. But like your quads and your biceps and your lats and you're like, like you can work those super hard. So exercises that have no real core stability demand, core demand, like a chest supported row or a friggin' leg extension or a bicep curl or a lateral raise or a tricep extension or a calf raise or hamstring curl, like you can train those really, really hard. You're like, your pelvic floor is not taking a beating doing a leg seated leg extension. However, there are other exercises that do require quite a bit of core demand and, and a little bit more of a um, a breathing and bracing. Things like the hack squat, maybe things like the RDLs, things like split squats. So you, we are going to look at our exercises in that way. And the exercises that do have a lot of this core demand we are really going to work on connecting with your breath and we are going to start on the really, not really ridiculously easy, but way easier on RDLs in terms of proximity to failure, reps in the tank, than we will on bicep curls. I mean, the first day we have incline curls, babe, and you're going to take incline curls to failure. Like what, what about an incline curl? Can you not take, you know, is a, you know, uh, um, 
um, doesn't allow you to go to failure or contraindicates your ability to go to failure, like nothing. So I think a lot of people, I'm not saying, I'm not saying a lot of people think they can't do stuff and you can really do stuff. But I, what I am saying is that there are certain exercises that require more of um, our attention right now. And they are the ones that have a high core demand, RDL, split squats, hack squats, maybe hip extensions. Um, and we will do that. We will start a little bit easier. We'll focus more on breath. We'll talk more about breathing patterns. Um, but shit, man, when, when, when you lock into a chest supported row, like have at it, Hoss, you know, like that's going to be something that's real. I'm really excited to see for you. It's gonna be super fun. We'll document it a bit more. Um, last question. Somebody asked something that surprised you about your partner. Um, I'll go first and you can think of anything that surprised you. I actually, I think it surprises like, um, in, implies like I thought x and turned out y and that that isn't I, there's nothing that surprised me in that way but i guess i've been surprised at how nurturing is on a as a skill that is on a spectrum like you are incredibly nurturing in an innate way that is like it's either been in you since the day you were born or it's been in you since the day you were born plus all of your life experiences have led you to be like this but you are I, I, I love her. I love my daughter more than I've ever loved anything in my life. And I'm, I'm going to be there. I'm going to try and be her rock. But like you are just, it's, it's, I, I'm watching it and I'm like, I, I'm, I don't even, I'm struggling for words. I'm going to cry a little bit, but like, it's, it's so amazing to see like the, and I've talked about this on the podcast with buddy macros and stuff, but like, it, it really is. I thought, I guess I didn't know how much it could vary from person to person. And I think I'm doing an okay job, but I'm watching you and I'm like, damn, like th thank I'm thanking God that I have you. She's the luckiest person ever. Um, and I told you last night when we were in bed that even though I want to tell you all the time that I think you are the best and, and I, I'm blown away and I'm learning stuff every day from you, I also don't want you to feel like just because I'm telling you that, that you need to be perfect all the time because I feel like we can build people up a lot. And I want to tell you that you're an amazing mom and that you are unreal patient, like unreal patient. Um, and, but I don't want to set you up so that if you ever, like, I, I want to tell you that while I also know that there are going to be moments where we all kind of get, both of us get overwhelmed. So I'm not surprised. Like, I didn't think you'd be that way, but like, it's, yeah, the, the like the the innate human skill of being a nurturer like is it varies and you have it and that's so cool and I'm so thankful that you that you have it um and I'm learning from you every day and so that's what I wanted to say. Well, that was super nice. <laughs> that was nice. Thank you. Um the thing that surprised me the most about you is how quickly you've taken on Diaper role. changing duty and I'm um, how excited I am when my daughter poops. Yeah, but for somebody who's just never held a baby before and has never been around babies, you've taken on the role as dad and have worn so many hats in such a short period of time. Like you are still running your business full time. You're also an amazing husband. Everything that I need, you drop what you're doing and you get it to me. You cook me meals. You make sure that I'm staying hydrated and you are such a good dad to Emerson like everything that she needs every dirty diaper that needs to be changed every burp that she ne needs to have you know after a feed you are there you know no questions asked um, you never do it complaining and for somebody who like I said is running a business full-time and is constantly working like you're still super present and you're still there and not just for her but for me as well and that is everything and more especially as a mom who you know, it's, it's like you, we talked about breastfeeding, like is on call 24 seven. You're also there 24 seven whenever she or I need you. Um, and you've just taken to being dad so, so well in such a short amount of time. I'm sure that was a huge transition for you and, you know, something so new that you've never really experienced before. I'm sure it's scary. And I just want you to know you're doing an amazing job and she's lucky to have you and I'm lucky to have you. And we, Love everything that you do for us and for our family. Thanks, babe. Yeah, it's funny. Emerson's in the baby Bjorn right now in between us bouncing. And we could tell she's, I mean, we knew, we like scheduled this nap. We like did everything that we could to kind of, and then we were like waiting for her to fall asleep. Right when she fell asleep, we hit record. And so we're, on, we're coming up on an hour mark um, and she's just starting to fuss. And so I don't know how much longer we have, but um, 
Somebody said, essentially, like, you guys are making it look so easy. Is it really easy? What are some things that are making it easy? We've covered some of them. I will start by saying it looks way easier because of friggin' social media, of course. Um, yeah, I, we don't we don't post. We should start posting her yeah. screaming, crying yeah, before totally. bed. That hour before bed sometimes. Yeah, last time two hours of screaming, just like... And, and I think there's an element here of, of optimism is a choice. Like, there are... I don't think we are it's been easy because she's been an easy baby. I think it's been, it's, it's not been easy, but I think it's been a fun experience for a lot of reasons, for a lot of reasons. But one of them has been just really trying to choose to be mega, mega present and like, know that like we get, like she's already changed so much. And yeah, that I have the background on my phone from her in the hospital and it's already like a completely different baby. So really, 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 really trying to stay present and know that like, even in the sucky moments, like you're going to wish them back. You're going to wish them back with, every ounce of your might one day um those little micro systems that we talked about I, just relationship wise i know it's a little bit of couple, couples therapy now but relationship wise something that really helps me jen is giving me explicit instructions like i don't like i get decision fatigue and i i just i want us to be like you know what like and you do this you do this because there are moments where i know you could change her but you're like no jordan said he's changing her so anytime during the day she poops she needs to change you text me or you call me because you know that's a job i want to do obviously because you're doing a lot of other things too. Um, so I think that that communication of like, Jen, I need you to explicitly tell me what to do. We need to divide and conquer. Like that's sort of like not, you know, she poops and cries and whines like many times per day. Like the decision fatigue of who's doing what kind of, it just can get to you. So I, I that's been really helpful for me. So my, the little micro systems, dividing up tasks, like I cook dinner every night because you're doing X and I take the dogs out for the morning. And, and so just having a little bit of those systems has been super helpful. What else jumps to mind for you is like things that have, again, not made it, made it look easy, but things that really have helped. I mean, I think we have a great foundation before she was even born, just as far as communication with one another and being each other's best friends and just being always on the same page. Like you and I really don't ever, I hate to say this, but like we really don't ever fight. Like we have like very minor disagreements and we're just we're just always on the same page. We have really great communication skills and that transitioned really well into bringing her home. Um, you communicate what you need. I communicate what I need. And that's that. Um, so that's definitely made things look easy. And I, you said, you know, saying she's a really good baby I personally think she's a great baby like she she really is great during the day like she doesn't cry she's very easily soothed um when she does cry like you know what's wrong and you can very quickly fix it if she is having a moment where we do have at night just before bed her witching hour some not every night but some nights where she loses her absolute shit and she screams her her little lungs out for an hour or more nonstop. no matter what you do you cannot fix it we, I mean, we, other than that, I mean, I personally, she's, pretty, yeah, she's yeah, a pretty easy baby. And from night one, like she was sleeping three plus hours at a time. Um, so have we had it maybe easier than a parent who has a Definitely. colicky baby yeah, or a baby with, you know, some other issues? Absolutely. Definitely. But I just think having really good communication with your partner and constantly communicating what you need or what you want and being on the same page it's just made things so much easier for us. There, There's no second, you know, guessing, is Jordan going to do this? Am I going to do that? Like you said, you cook dinner, you take care of the dogs. I'm on baby duty. You know, we have those roles established. And that has definitely made being first-time parents in the first six weeks a little bit easier. Um, but that's not to say we don't have moments because we absolutely do. And just because we look like we have it together 24-7 doesn't mean we do. Because there's moments when she's screaming her head off that, I'm also screaming my head off on the inside because I don't know how to fix it. Um, so do we make it look easy? Maybe, but that's also just because it's social media and you're only seeing a glimpse into our day. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, favorite obscure thing about her that kills you every time you see it? Everything. What's well, like a random thing that you see and you're like oh that's her thing and it used to be it used to be when I breastfeed I would play with her little hair by her ear I would like tuck her hair behind her ear and then I would mess it up again and then I would tuck it back behind her ear but she's recently lost a lot of her hair so I don't get to do that anymore which is devastating um 
Oh my God. Everything about her. The elbow dimple. The elbow dimple. The the thigh rolls are getting a little her bit me- meatier and that just, I can't wait. To, I'm going to eat them. Um, Her little toes, her little fingers. Sometimes she'll hold my finger while we're breastfeeding. That also melts my heart. Her bottom lip when she cries. Yeah. Like quivers. Uh, it literally kills me. It kills her me. Her little rat tail. Her little rat tail. She has like a little rat tail hair because she went. <laughs> she went bald. She like started going bald on top of her head, but like the back, her the back of her head hair is still there, and you can like pinch the back of her hair into like a little rat tail. It's not like a ponytail. It's like literally a, like that kid that kid in high school that you like don't want to go near. That's like this weird rat tail haircut. Um, just kidding. Um, yeah. Little, just like little things like that, that like that like we will remember. I think that like will change about her. Um, hopefully, hopefully the rat tail thing changes. But for now, I'm enjoying it. Anything else we want to talk about, babe? There's no other. Uh, those were all the other questions. No, I, I mean she's We've, just an absolute blessing. I love her more than anything. Like words can't even begin to describe the amount of love that I have for her. And you know, people have always said, you know, time goes by really fast, and the days are long, but the years are. Or, yeah, the days are long and the years are short. Um, and I, it used to bother me. I was just like, shut up. Like, I hear it from everybody. But now that you're in it, you're like, holy shit. The last six weeks have gone by faster than any period of time in my entire life. And I feel like just yesterday, I was rubbing my belly, feeling her kick. And today, she's, you know, smiling at us. She's starting to coo. Like, things are happening and things are changing. So it's really important to be as present as possible and not blink because you're going to miss a lot. All right. Let's close it off on that. We have, we got, we, we, I'm over here. Like she's, it's not like she's been an easy baby. Like I've just been like bouncing around this baby born for like an hour and 10 minutes and she's whatever. She's gotten up a few times, but she went back to sleep. So yeah, she's definitely not, she's definitely not a bad, definitely not a hard baby. So, um, cool. We'll end it there. Thanks for listening guys. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks for coming, Jen. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Where Optimal Meets Practical. If you liked the episode, it would mean the world to me if you posted a screenshot to your social media or left a five-star review on iTunes. That stuff really helps. If you ever want to get in touch with me, just shoot me a DM on Instagram, at Jordan Lips Fitness. I'm always around to chat. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.